In the 1960s, French scientists built the world's largest solar furnace. The French have put together an amazing furnace which can amplify the sun with about 20,000 mirrors. It can concentrate sunlight enough to create temperatures in excess of 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That will burn through a 3 8 inch steel plate in less than a minute. How do we withstand the heat when it shows up in our lives? When it's physical heat, hopefully we find some place that's got air conditioning, we crank that all the way up, we drink cool drinks, and we do what we can to manage. But what happens when it's a different kind of heat? It really does bring up the idea that withstanding the heat when it shows up in our lives is a crucial decision that we need to make before the heat is applied. I would love to say that everything is always going to be cool and collected and cozy, but that's not the way life works. So when the fire shows up, when we feel like we're being tossed into the furnace, how do we deal with that? And so one of the best known stories from the book of Daniel chapter 3 might give us some insight in how to deal with the fire. We will not read the entire chapter in depth today. We're going to skim through parts of it and zero in on verses 13 to 18. The entire chapter is Daniel's description of fiery facts. Verses 1 through 12 are the representation and the recrimination. The king has built a representation of himself. He's built a statue that is 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide, and it's made out of gold. And he demanded that everybody in his kingdom would bow down and worship this huge statue. We aren't exactly told why he does this from chapter 3. But remember, last week, the king had a very disturbing dream, and he was looking for a wise man who could tell him what the dream was and what it meant. Last week, we only got to deal with the puzzle part of that dream, but we didn't talk specifically about the content of that dream. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of an enormous statue. And Daniel told the king that the dream statue represented his kingdom. In the very next chapter, we see that the king has commissioned a gigantic statue in reality, which he then commands that everyone in his kingdom bow down and worship. It seems pretty obvious that King Nebuchadnezzar was intent on making his dream a reality, that everyone would recognize that he was a worthy king and should be revered as such. That's the gist of verses 1 through 7. Verses 8 through 12 are the recrimination. Let's summarize. You see, there are some non-Jewish people who are in the wise men class, and they're pretty upset about how Daniel... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have been doing in the non-Jewish Babylonian court. And they say, uh, wait a minute, king. You made a rule that everybody's supposed to bow down and worship your image, but these Jews refuse to do that. You have to have them killed. That takes us through verse 12. So now let's look at the details from verses 13 to 18. Verse 13 Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image that I made, well, very good. But if you do not worship it, you could just about sense the finger wagging, right? You will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you out of my hand? Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reply to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. So in Daniel's description of fiery facts, verses 13 and 14 are the rejection. Look at this phrase. Is it true that you don't worship? The king is asking, you don't serve my gods? You refuse to worship my image? And I want to make sure that we understand, I don't think this is the my as in possessive, as in like, I own this statue. I'm pretty sure this statue looked like Nebuchadnezzar. 
Nebuchadnezzar makes a 90 feet tall, nine foot wide, solid gold representation of himself. I think this is my opinion, can't find it in the text, but I'm pretty sure that would explain why he's so immediately incensed. Because Nebuchadnezzar isn't just saying, I've passed a law, you, everybody has to obey the law. This is the same thing as following a speed limit sign. No, 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 no. You don't worship my image? Ugh, he's really offended. Now, from our standpoint, looking back at this narrative, of course that's true. Of course, Jewish refugees from exile in Babylon aren't going to worship Babylonian gods. They're not going to worship the golden image of anything. That went badly for Jews before with the golden calf. Remember that part? So, of course, they're not going to do that. The whole point of Daniel is that Daniel and his buddies can be used of God in a pagan land. But the people who live in the pagan land, they don't get that. The world doesn't get that. It wants to equate all religious expressions as the same. Crying out loud. The beginning of the Olympic Games this last week. If you haven't heard about this, there are so many people who are losing their composure over what they think is an insult to Christianity when the depictions made were pre-Christian. They were pagan. They were absolutely pagan. But looking at a representation of a pagan god is offensive to Christians who understand that there is an actual, real god that isn't blue and drinking wine. We don't need to be offended or dismayed when the world misunderstands, either mistakenly or intentionally, who God really is. Pagans have been misunderstanding and mischaracterizing Christian faith as long as Christian faith has been around. We shouldn't be surprised when they still happen. They don't know God, so of course they're going to get it wrong when they start to think about what worship and veneration really is. We see this in verse 15 as well. Look at the challenge that King Nebuchadnezzar gives to these three. What God will be able to rescue you from my hand? This king is absolutely setting himself up to be the final authority. Come on, I'm about to throw you into a furnace. Why not just go along to get along? No God is going to be able to say because they understand that their little G gods are placeholders for worship. We have in us an innate need to worship something bigger than ourselves, to actually worship Yahweh, the creator of the actual universe. But that requires complete surrender to him. And lots of people don't want to do that. So they substitute. They make substitutions, and instead they worship little g-gods, things that don't really have any power. And so when people find themselves in big trouble, like about to be thrown into a fiery furnace, then the responses are going to show up, uh, come on, none of these little g-gods that we know about are going to be able to rescue you from that. So you probably shouldn't do whatever it is that's going to get you in trouble and thrown into the fiery furnace, the king thinks. And that's just a plain misunderstanding from the pagan mind. Since one religious system is just the same as another, they're just personal belief systems that make people feel better. But when you're in real trouble, what's going to happen when your God doesn't rescue? Verses 16 and 17 give us Shat, Drak, Meshach, and Abednego's response. Well, here's the truth, your kingship. The actual, real God that runs the universe, Yahweh, our God, he can rescue he can step right into the fire and not have a problem with it. He invented fire in the first place. Now, he might or might not choose to rescue, depending on what his will is, but there is no doubt that he can. These three men know God. They walk with the Lord, so they're not concerned about it. And in verse 18, they make sure to underline that thought. Even if he does not, even if he chooses not to rescue, we are still not going to worship anything else lesser than him. We're not going to cave in. We're not going to give in. In Daniel's description of fiery facts, it moves on to the roasting, the rescue, and the result. 19 to 23, the roasting, they get pitched into the fire. In fact, the fire is so hot that it kills the servants who were tasked 
with putting Rack Shack and Benny in there in the first place. If you have not heard before, by the way, Rack Shack and Benny is the Veggie Tales short version of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Verses 24 and 25, I think, is the sweet spot in the whole narrative. The king looks into the fire and starts counting. One, two, three, four, four. We threw three guys in there. The other guys that were close to it all died because it was so hot. How come there are four guys in there and one is like a son of the gods? Verses 26 through 30, of course, tell us the result. They stroll on out of the furnace. They come out of the fire. They're not singed. Their clothes aren't torched. They don't even smell like barbecue. They are completely unharmed by the fire. And the king is blown away. Nebuchadnezzar realizes that there is an actual, real, capital G God who is protecting these men, and he makes an edict. Nobody is to say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because no other God can do what their God can do. Don't you wish more people in a watching world would come to that conclusion about Jesus? And here's a closing thought to consider. The king's statement in verse 25 about a son of the gods, from his standpoint, is just using a description of something that he can't really wrap his head around. He's trying to understand it, so he uses the phrase, like a son of the gods. So we need to be pretty careful that we don't read into what King Nebuchadnezzar says here. He is not saying, oh, that's Jesus. He doesn't know that. He can't know that. We know that. Looking back on it, we can realize that's Jesus showing off. That's what's happening there. But that's not actually in the text of Daniel. That comes from our understanding of the New Testament. Teachings about Christ that have been laid over what is taught in the Old Testament. Looking back on this, we can understand that the pre-incarnate Christ is the Son of God in the fire. He's not like a son of the gods. He is the Son of God. Standing in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we can trust that when we go through the fire, whatever it is ourselves, that we can expect Jesus to show up as well. Either to stand with us in it or to take us home because of it. Let's pray. So Lord, the truth of it is we don't like pain. We don't like being put in situations that are terrifying and imply that we're going to experience something that we don't want to experience. We don't want that one little bit. We want a nice, comfortable, safe life. But that's not necessarily the case for all of your followers. It might be the time that you call us to go through something that we don't want to go through. And in those times, help us to remember that you are standing right with us. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. We are never going to be alone when we face whatever we have to face. You are right there, and we're so grateful for that. And so, Lord, if there's anyone who has heard this sermon, whether in the building or through a recording, if they don't have that assurance that you're going to stand right there with them, if they don't know you, if they haven't trusted you, I pray, Lord, that you would draw them to do that now, that they would say something simple like, Lord, you win. You get to control my life. I am not calling the shots anymore. I will trust that you will stand with me no matter what. And so when the time comes for all of us to stand in front of you on judgment day, you will say, this one belongs to me. Enter into your rest. We pray that you would call us home, Lord, no matter what the circumstances, all in Jesus' name. Amen.